Hello and welcome to Grace Life Honduras. We are a gospel-centered church family focused on reaching the unreached and making disciples. We pray that this teaching will help you to grow in your relationship with Jesus and discover more of the reality of Christianity. Hello again and welcome back to Grace Life Doers. I'm Alicia and we are going to get right into the Word to help you discover the reality of your faith. If you are a Christian, welcome and I think you'll enjoy what we're going to be sharing about Colossians as we continue on. If you are not a believer yet and you are just considering faith or looking into faith, I believe you're going to be blessed and really touched by what's being shared here and that it will help to lead you forward in your decision to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. So here we go. Grab a pen, a Bible, a notebook, and something to drink. I've got water. It's summer here in Albania. Let's pray. Father, you are a good Father, and um, we have been fearfully and wonderfully made by you. And we want to acknowledge and really appreciate who you are as God, that you are Lord, that you are worthy of all our praise, you are worthy of our lives. You are worthy of so much more than that. You are worthy of everything we can imagine and even more. And we want to just thank you for giving us this incredible blessing of having the word that we can know you, we can search out your ways, and that we are able to come into a close fellowship with you, both as Lord and as Father. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. Wonderful. So, we are in Colossians 1, and we've been stuck there for a while, which is good. Never bad getting stuck in a part of Scripture when you're doing a deeper study or in the Bible. So, we are going to be looking at Colossians 1 verse 10. And actually, I started with it last week. And we spoke mostly about so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. I want us today to focus on the second part of this verse, which is to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Remember now, Paul is still praying. Paul starts to pray in verse 9 and he's praying for the Colossians. And this is a very incredibly powerful prayer. And we're stopping to have a look at it because prayer works, prayer changes things. And so uh, Paul records this here for all to read. And for all to know that this is wisdom, what we're praying for um, here or what he's praying for is wisdom. It's not just praying for a new house or praying to have more. Not that those things are bad in itself. We all need a house to live. We need to get around. But um, what he's praying for is something way, way more important. He's praying that we will increase in the knowledge of God's will. Why? Because we need spiritual wisdom and insight and understanding and what is the result of that i said last week the result of the correct and accurate and deep knowledge of god is that we will walk in what in a manner worthy of the lord the more we get to know the lord for who he really is according to his will which we only clearly see in the person of jesus the more we get to understand that the more it will affect our walk When it affects our walk, the walk will start to be a walk that is a manner worthy. It is equal to, I said that last week, go back to the series and listen to it, to the Lord. But today I want us to look at these words because I really believe that lots of us are trying to live in a way that pleases the Lord. I believe that this is an important thing. It's not something that we should just walk by and say, oh, who cares whether I please the Lord or not? He is God. As I prayed earlier, he deserves more than we could ever give in our lifetime. So how? How can we actually please the Lord? This is a very important question. Because if God is real and if there is a God, which there is, which has so much evidence in um, every field of study, when we look at that and we come to the conclusion, okay, there must be a God, then we must also with that conclusion recognize and realize that there is a way to get to him. And if there is a way to get to God, then there must be in that way, a way that pleases him. Okay. And this prayer is saying we can please him in all respects and in pleasing him because of the walk we walk, because of the knowledge we have, we can bear good fruit. So let's look at the word please. So the word please just simply means to accommodate oneself to the opinions, desires, 
and interest of others. So in this case, in this scripture, it's talking about to accommodate oneself to the opinions, desires, and interests of God. What we need to recognize here is that we will either live our lives pleasing ourselves, which is a form of idol worship. We'll get into that. We will live our lives pleasing others, or we will live a life pleasing God. But you cannot do all three at the same time. The Bible basically makes it impossible. Okay, look at some of the scriptures. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 4. Take a minute and page there. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul is again speaking about this reality of pleasing the Lord. Okay, he says, But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God who examines our heart. See here, a distinction is being made by Paul between living to please man and living to please God. He is basically saying we are either living to please man or we are living to please God. But both of these we cannot do at the same time. Why? Because man looks at the outward appearance. Doesn't matter how great you think you are, you will still make judgments based on outside uh, outward appearances. And in some cases, it's great. If you see a guy walking in an alley in the middle of the night coming towards you with a knife in your hand, please run away. This is a good judgment. However, where we really fail is where God does not. God looks at the heart we see this in 1 Samuel 16 verse 7, and therefore he is the one who actually knows the best. So when we judge and when we look at outside appearances, when we look, even no matter how good we get to know a friend, you can never know their inner, inner, inner thoughts, their inner fears, as well as God does. So if we want to live to please man, we will always be like a roller coaster. We'll be up one day, down another day. We'll never know, are we pleasing enough or are we not pleasing enough? And to be honest, in relationships, one day you could be pleasing to someone and the next day you're not. So your life will be horrible. However, if we set our mind, our heart and our focus to please the Lord, knowing that we please him when we believe, so we'll get into that, we know that he's not like man. He doesn't judge with the eyes, but he looks upon the heart. And that should bring great confidence to a believer. Look at Galatians 1 verse 10, and I'll tell you why. Galatians 1 verse 10. Come page there also. I think I'm going to get it. Um, this is really important. So Galatians 1 verse 10. Look what it says. It says, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I was still trying to please men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. That is an incredible statement. Paul is literally making a distinction between living for God and living for man. To the degree that we cannot serve Jesus as Lord and please man at the very same time. I love this statement which was made once that says, If you don't live by the praise of men, you won't die by their criticism. If you don't live by the praise of men, you won't die by their criticism. Such a good statement. Now, why is all of this important to know? Is because if we know that as we come to Christ, we have become new, we will know how to please the Lord. Now, I'm jumping ahead, so I'm going to stop. Okay, so this is the first place we can live in, the realm where we're constantly trying to please man. And you'll very quickly see in your own life where you are with that. Um, but what you need to see there above everything is if we are living for the focus or the attention or the approval of man, we cannot live for the approval of God. They are two polar opposites. Why? Because God looks at the heart. And we don't know what's in the heart of a person. But God does, and God knows what's in our hearts. And we're going to look at that in a moment. So the other place we can live in, the other extreme, is to live living to please oneself. Now, in today's world, you do not need to look far to see how that looks. Uh, I was I really enjoy watching a little basketball game video with my son because of my son's expressions. He's three years old and he just loves basketball. Um, but when I look at these men, grown men, and the way they react towards scoring a goal or anything like that, I find myself just 
warning my son that the praise of man means nothing. This is just a game. And then you see how self-focused those athletes are and you think, wow, what has happened to the world? And that's just one silly example. And of course, there's Christians out there as well. Praise God for that. Um, but overall, it's really incredible to see how everything these days is just about yourself, just about self. Look, now people might say it's a new thing and then people might see, see, the Bible is irrelevant. What can it help in a time like this where people are just thinking about themselves? Well, in the book of Judges, which was literally written thousands of years ago, in the book of Judges, it, it's been recorded in Judges 17 verse 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Well, there was no king in Israel, no leader, and every man, God appointed leader, so every man just did what was right in his own eyes. Isn't that the same today? People do not want to make God Lord of their life. They don't want to do it his way. They want to do it their own way. They want to create little gods that they like, a God that fits their picture. And then in that way, they will serve God, which actually means they're just serving themselves. Every man did what was right in his own eyes because they did not have a clear picture of who God was. They did not have a king, a leader, a ruler. And in today's every single culture in the world, how many cultures are pushing God aside saying we can do it in our own way? And what will happen? They will judge right and wrong in their own eyes, which is impossible to do. Look at what the Proverbs writer says in Proverbs 14 verse 12. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. That is incredible. What does he mean when he says this? What is the, the scriptures trying to show us here? Well, they're showing us a form of idol worship. It's very interesting, and I'm not going to go into this too much, but just follow me for a minute. It's very interesting that when God created man, he said, this, the scriptures show us in Genesis, God created man in his image. That word image is like the same word that you would use for an idol. And so the idea was that when other people see Adam and Eve, they would see an idol of God. They would see a representation of God on the earth. But what happened? Man gave in to the temptation. They were deceived. They gave in to the temptation and they chose to sin. Okay. When they did that, they, they, it, they kind of exchange, it's not exchanged, but they distorted that image, because the very first thing we see is that God created man in his image. What does that mean? We were supposed to look to God to see who we are. The very first thing that happens after sin is that Adam and Eve looks at each other. And in each other, man to man, creation to creation, now they see what looks right in their eyes or what looks wrong in their eyes. They judge for themselves and they become each other's idols. And isn't this happening all over the world today? It's just forms of idol worship. What If you've ever seen an idol, uh, any kind of image or, or you know, any statue trying to be a statue that represents God, you will see that those things are all man-made ways of making God um, visible in a way that we like, in a way that suits our thinking or our ideas. God is completely against it. Why? Because it distorts completely who God is. And it always leads to a form of self-worship. We end up becoming our own idol, especially, and a lot of people do this, a lot of people come to the Christian faith or even to any faith and they come to it and they say, I like this, I like that, I'll take this, I'll take that, I don't like that, don't really like that, so I'll just take this, this, this and that. All you're doing is creating an idol. You are creating a God that serves you, that fits your image of who God should be, could be, or whatever. And that's how you live. But that, my dear friend, will never produce true saving salvation. God is who he is. God is who he has revealed himself to be through Jesus. And there's no way around it. We're either going to bend our knee to it, or we're going to refuse it, harden our hearts, and walk away from it. But this is who he is. And as we have the right to have a will, so he has the right to have a will, even more so. And praise God, his will is that which is good and perfect and acceptable because he is Lord. You know, but really, I see this so much in the culture and even in church. 
even in many Christian circles where we try to make, and in my own life, where I try to make God fit the mold of what would fit me, instead of saying, Lord, you are Lord. And I cannot please you in a way that I think I should be pleasing you. Why? Because you do not look at outward actions. You look at the condition of the heart. And no one can change the heart except God. So for a God who looks at the heart, even the prophets understood what was wrong with the heart. In Isaiah 64 verse 6, it says, the prophet Isaiah says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. All our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our inequities like the wind take us away. See, the prophet is speaking of a condition of man without a born-again heart. If we do not have a born-again heart, a new heart, it is impossible to please God. Doesn't matter how good our work is. That's why religion can't save you. It cannot save you. Only Jesus saves. Why? Because he came to fulfill the scripture. He came to make an end to that old heart. Um, sorry, not to fulfill the scripture, but he came to show us what it's like to be one who lives as a new heart, a new creation. Now, I'm going to try my best to explain this to you, but on Sunday, I had two bottles in my hand. Each one of, uh, so one, each bottle had some gelatine inside. The one gelatine was extremely dirty, and the other gelatine was clean gelatine that you could see through. It was like a yellow color. So the one is dirty and the other one is clean. And I use this example. I said, many Christians um, don't understand, or many believers, and even unbelievers, actually many of us, uh, don't understand what it means to be a new creation and what faith really is about. We make it about outward appearance or inward, things that we have to believe, um, things that we have to try and do better, but that is not what true saving faith is about, not according to God. Isaiah shows that the whole scripture, all the books, Genesis to Malachi, shows us man will always fall short. Man will never be enough if we try and be good enough for God in our own effort. So imagine with me that in my left hand, I am holding on to a bottle that is full of dirt. In my right hand, I have a bottle that is full of clean, something clean and pure, okay? What is this I saying? He is saying that no matter what we do from this dirty heart, no matter what comes out of it, it is dirty. Why? Because the problem is the condition of the heart. So within this bottle in my left hand that has all the dirt inside, I, draw, I took out a fruit. I put a fruit inside and I took it out. I said, now this fruit, even though it is a fruit and it should be good because it comes from the condition of that dark heart, that, that um, unrenewed heart, it cannot please God. Even though other people can eat that fruit, even though it is a fruit, it, in God's eyes, the problem is not the fruit, the problem is the condition of the heart. No matter what fruit it produces, it cannot please God. Therefore, our actions, our right thought, thinking, our right meditation, our Zen strategies to focus on God, none of that at all pleases God when it comes from the unrenewed heart, a broken heart, a heart that doesn't function. It is all according to the prophet, according to the word of God, said to be filthy rags. We cannot trust it for making us right with God or even bringing us closer to God because of the source, you see? However, there is a beautiful promise in the book of Ezekiel, another prophet, who says that God is going to do something, which he did do in Jesus, that he will give a new heart. Listen to this prophecy in Ezekiel 36, verse 26 to 27. Moreover, I will give you, who is this I, God, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You see, the walk or the actions of the born again believer can please God. Why? Because it's not birthed out of the flesh, which is a form of idol worship. 
That's all you can ever get when you're still in that broken condition, in that dirty, unrenewed heart. Doesn't matter how good you are, doesn't matter how much you give to charities, doesn't matter how many people you help. The reality is that's all fruit coming from an unrenewed heart, a heart that cannot please God. Not because God is mean, but that is a heart, an unrenewed heart condition, and it only serves to please itself even in any form of godly worship. But however, when God sent Jesus, Jesus walked on the earth as one who had a heart that was not damaged. He walked like the bottle in my right hand. He walked on the earth and demonstrated to us what it is like to be born from above, what it is like to have a heart that's not contaminated with sin, that's renewed, a new creation. What is it like? One that never existed before. We saw it only in one person, in Jesus, the last Adam, better than the first Adam. Nothing even to compare each other to. <laughs> and so we see in Jesus <clears throat> what it's like to walk on the earth with this clean heart, this pure heart, where the heart, the nature is new. So what does he do when he dies and he's raised from the dead by God? He appears to his um, to more than 500 people seeing him at the same time. And then he's he ta is taken back or he disappears back into heaven, the heavenlies. Now he says, before that, don't worry, I'm sending my spirit. That who I am, I will send into you. And what will happen? You will become a new creation. Look at it in, Cor in Corinthians. You will become a new creation. All things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. What is he saying? He's saying, I will put my spirit in you. The same spirit you saw in me, the same way you saw me walk, I am giving to you the same walk. I am giving you the same spirit. And even if now you are naturally born again as a man, you can be born again as a spiritually alive man. And now your spirit and your heart, your new heart is a clean heart. And the best thing is about that heart, as it says in Ephesians, that heart has been sealed. So if you imagine the bottle in my right hand, this clean heart, I put a lid on it and I close it. And now that sealing speaks about sealing it to such a degree that nothing bad can come in and the good thing inside cannot be spoiled. That is how you've been sealed. That is the new creation. And that, my dear friends, and that alone is what it's means to have faith that's what faith is about that's what religion if you want to say it like that what it's about what is it about it's about how to become new how do we become born again through jesus christ he is the only way to have a heart that pleases god when you receive jesus as your personal lord and savior you please god why? When he looks at you, it's like he sees that bottle in my right hand. He sees the clean heart. Now that clean heart can produce fruit. And that fruit, the bearing fruit in every good work, that fruit can please him even more. Because why? It is coming from this new heart. Now, there are times in our lives as Christians, we still fail, we still get things wrong, we mess up, we make mistakes. Of course, we are not saying we, are, we got born again and then we're perfect in our actions, no. But the reason why we still see those fruit is because of our unrenewed mind. We don't understand yet in certain areas of our life who we are for sure, for real in Jesus, the new creation. And when we cease or stop or fail to see that for what it really is and how clearly we should see it then we will fail in our actions thoughts emotions and whatever else because we don't see him for who he really is and for what he has truly done in us through jesus okay but that does not mean that that fruit that you do not like that that is coming from the new heart that's coming from an unrenewed mind not a new heart and so your heart stays clean your heart stays pure but these things that come from it that might not look like that clean heart, that's not your identity. That's an unrenewed mind. Now, what do we want to do? We want to start fixing the fruit. But my dear friend, you can't fix the fruit. 
You can't fix the fruit. Go back to the root. If you are a believer, then go back to what you know, because what I'm telling you today and what I showed the church on Sunday is that an accurate, deep knowledge of who God is, his will, which is only possible through seeing Jesus. When we see that, we come to an accurate knowledge of who God is. And when we come to an accurate knowledge of who God is, it affects our walk and our walk will produce something that pleases the Lord that that will have fruit and guess what the reward of that walk and that fruit is a better knowledge of God isn't that incredible it goes full circle you see we see in Hebrews 8 that Jesus did in fact give us this new heart we have a new heart and it works God did it it works now we can bear fruit and when we have fruit that we don't like it's very easy to just look at that fruit and go is that really Jesus evidence? Am I producing Jesus evidence? If not, then I just need to go back to my knowledge of God. Look at what it says in John 8 verse 31 to 32. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. We need to constantly look at whether what we believe about Jesus is resulting in in godly freedom. Jesus didn't come to set us free and then nothing. Jesus came to set us free so we may bear fruit to God. We are freed so we may serve the Lord. We are freed so that we may be in the kingdom of life. We are freed so that we may be children of God. Now we can have fruit. Now we can bear fruit. Now we can please God. Why? Because we are His. Okay? If somebody says they're free but we don't see godly freedom in them stop listening to them stop following them ignore them because why the true fruit of someone who's truly free will always have jesus evidence okay look at romans 7 verse 4 romans 7 verse 4 therefore my brethren you also were made to die to the law through the body of christ so that you might be joined to another to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. We are bearing fruit. And for who is it? The fruit of God. Sometimes we can hold on to beliefs and things that we've heard before by someone we respect. And we, we really struggle to let go of that. But when we look at that fruit through the lenses of the finished work of Jesus, as explained in the letters, we might need to realize that the fruit of the belief is not resulting the evidence according to what God wants it. Then we need to let go, humble ourselves and say, Father, I'm looking again. What did you do in the new creation? Who am I? Who are you? Show me. Because an accurate of knowledge of God will always lead to a walk. That walk leads to an experience and that experience then leads to a greater knowledge of God. That should never be turned upside down. We should never, our accurate knowledge of God should determine our walk and our experience, not our experience determine our knowledge of God, because that is really important, because experiences can be wrong. Now, in the world, you will see many people doing great works that have nothing to do with Jesus. And the world is full of those good works, and they bear fruit. They're convincing people that you can do good enough without making Jesus Lord of your life. But, dear listener, the... the um, the point of life, there you go, the point of life is not living morally right, being a good purpose. That's Being a good per person is not the purpose of life. It doesn't matter. The purpose of life is to find God through Jesus so you may be saved, so you may spend eternity with him and start to experience eternity in you as you walk in this earth today. And so I want to leave you with this thought that Paul's definitions of good work is always linking to understanding the gospel that always results and should result in our hearts submitting to Jesus as Lord. So it doesn't always result to that, but it should result in that. And then as we're able to receive Jesus as our Lord, we are then enabled to share that with others through our lives, through our testimonies and through our deeds, through our fruit to such a degree that they would come and say, I want Jesus as my Lord. And that work pleases the Lord to see every single person from every nation come and receive him personally and be reunited to God once and forever. I hope this blessed you and I believe 
that um, if you listen to it with an open heart, you would hear more than what I shared today, but that you would hear the Lord calling out to you saying, I am pleased in you when you have Jesus. I am pleased in you. But also that there is a greater call to more fruitfulness. And as you look to the new creation, as you look who Je what Jesus has done for you, that you will start to see a transformation in your fruit and you'll start to see a transformation in your life. And if you're still on your journey of faith, I really believe this has brought you closer and I want to challenge you. Why wait? Receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior today. He has good things in store for you. And he has made a way which no man could make, a way to be restored back to God. You can find more of our free teachings on our website, www.gracelife.co. And if you're ever in the Duras area, we invite you to join us for one of our gatherings. Our aim is to help you discover Jesus, find family, and experience life. To contact us or to find out where and when we meet, visit our website, www.gracelife.co.